Hello, wonderful family. I welcome you to today's broadcast. I guarantee you it's going to be an awesome time in the presence of God. In fact, there is no better place to be on a Sunday morning than a place where you can hear the word of God, where worship is going on, where prayer is going on. It's got to be something that has to do with the word of God and then how we are preparing ourselves for eternal life. Life is actually about focus. Life is actually about purpose. And today we are going to use the pattern man himself, Jesus Christ. And my message for today is what I call the resolute Jesus. My name is Theophilus Lamte and this is the Theophilus Lamte Ministries. Shall we say a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we bless your name for an awesome time that your people are gathered here as always to listen to your word. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will grant us retentive memory that whatever we listen here today, we would be doers of that word and just not listeners of it because it is in the application that we get the full benefit of it, that your word says that we become wise people. I pray for myself, especially that you use me in spite of myself. Separate me, Lord Jesus, from your word and anoint these lips of clay that it will be a blessing to all and sundry. I pray for my brethren that are listening to me that you will give them a receptive spirit and a heart that is ready to receive your seed today, that when they receive that seed, it will grow and bear fruit in the lives of other people that come around them. We bless you. We thank you. We pray all this through the worthy name of your son and our savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Beloved, today is going to be a wonderful time. Like I said, the title of my message is The Resolute Jesus. The word resolute, if you look at it from the Oxford Dictionary, simply talks about an admirably purposeful person. An admirably purposeful person. It also talks about someone that is very determined and unwavering in the things that they do. So you see, you need to have um, a purpose. You need to have an agenda. And then because you are so purposeful, because you are so determined to achieve it, you are not wavering. That means circumstances, uh, that means stress, pressures of life should not be able to deter you from that agenda or purpose that you have. That is why he's saying that somebody can be so determined or somebody can so be so purposeful that a person becomes admirable. So if we are talking about the resolute Jesus, we are talking about the Jesus that we are supposed to mentor, the Jesus that we are supposed to look up to, the Jesus that is supposed to be the pattern man for us. And because of the fact that he was so purposeful in his assignment here on earth, he became an admirable figure for all of us. And that is why I'm seated here today. That is why you are also listening to me from the comfort of your homes, because there is a pattern man that did not give up here on earth. The resolute Jesus. He was so determined right from birth that we look at how he lived his life here on earth, even up to the time he was crucified on the cross. And he was bold enough to say that it is finished. Can I say it is finished when my time is up? Would you be able to say it is finished when your time is up? We can only do that if we become purposeful. If we follow through the agenda, if we follow through the purpose for which God created us to come and fulfill here on earth. And today we want to throw a little more light about the life of Jesus. We cannot exhaust it, but we'll take a particular part where some of the utterances he makes are very distinctive to make us understand that this is a man that is resolute. This is a man that is determined irrespective of whatever he will go through. The Bible verse is quite lengthy. I will not be able to read all of it. It's actually in Matthew chapter 27 from the verse 11 all the way to 26. I will read a little and then I will jump and then bring the conclusion because I want us to um, pay attention to particular parts of it. But as you relax in the comfort of your sofa today, you will be able to read for yourself and then you add more weight. And I believe that the Spirit of God will throw more light on those things that you are going to read in Matthew chapter 27 um, concerning the trial of Jesus when he was brought before Pontius Pilate. 
Our Bible reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 27 from the verse 11. Shall we read? Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priest and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they are bringing against you? Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah. He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Then the crowd shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. You can continue to the verse 26. And um, for lack of time, I just want to end here. But I wanted to um, land on the sentence which says, Crucify him. This is a man that has been brought um, because of false charges. The leading priest and the elders wanted to find a way to get this man killed because it seemed as if the things that Jesus was doing in their towns and the neighboring cities was making them very insignificant and unpopular. So they were hatching every plan possible to make sure that this man called Jesus will not exist. So they bring the man to um, the governor who was Pontius Pilate at the time. And Pontius Pilate had the opportunity of releasing one prisoner to the crowd as was the custom for the people whenever they were celebrating the Passover feast. So this time around, it was not coincidence, but it was just the time that the Passover was going on. And Bible makes us understand that there was a very notorious criminal. He was actually a revolutionist who had caused a lot of problems, who had um, committed murders and was also in the custody of the governor. So then they have these two people, Jesus and Barabbas. And then the governor goes ahead to ask them, which of these two do you want me to release to you? But because the leading priest and the elders already wanted Jesus dead. They had already gone ahead to incite the crowd so that when it was time for the governor to release one prisoner and then crucify the other, they would go for Barabbas, who was a wicked person, rather than releasing Jesus because of the hatred they had for Jesus. But it was so interesting that just before that time when the governor was about to ask um, the crowd to choose, the wife of the governor comes and releases a message to him. He said that, you know, this man called Jesus that you are uh, um, bringing before the crowd to crucify. I had a very terrible dream about him. He's an innocent man and leave him alone. So Pilate listening to the advice of the wife also did not want to put himself in the situation where he would have been the one that decided that Jesus should die. So then he goes back to ask the question again. And the crowd said, we want Barabbas to be released. Then he goes on to ask them, so if I release Barabbas, what do I do with Jesus, who is the Messiah? And then they told him, crucify him. So from that time, you realize that Pilate had already washed his hands off that um, sentence that the people were demanding. So it was nothing to do with Pilate. He gave that authority to the crowd. And he separated himself for it. Why am I giving the um, whole background of this story? What I am trying to portray here is that the resolute Jesus. Jesus, right from his birth, we saw that there was a time when the parents had to go for a census. And on their return, about three days into the journey, they realized that their son Jesus was not with them. 
they hurriedly went back to find out what the problem was or where he was. They thought actually he was amongst the other family members, but they discovered that he wasn't with them. So they went back to find out what the situation was. Upon their surprise, when they got back, they realized that Jesus was seated in the synagogue amongst teachers and high-ranking officials in the synagogue. And they were dialoguing. They were talking about um, things of the kingdom. There was teachings going on and he was asking them questions. So out of um, surprise, the parents asked him, what are you doing here? Why are you here? We've been searching for you all over this place. And this was the answer Jesus gave. And this time, Jesus was just around 12 years old. And he tells the parents that, why are you looking for me? You don't have to look for me. I'm going about my father's business. Wow, that was like a punch. But that was Jesus as 12 years. He knew exactly what he was about. He knew that his whole life was about a kingdom business. Don't forget that before he was released here on earth, the assignment was that he will come and die on the cross to redeem you and I from eternal condemnation. So right from birth, when he was able to start walking, everything Jesus was doing was very purposeful. He was so determined and unwavering that he focused on exactly why he was here on earth. So when other children his age will be going to play and playing football and everything, he was always found in the synagogue. He wanted to do what the father asked him to do. He was so focused on it that he could not turn to the left and the right. So although the parents did not understand him that early ages, everything Jesus was doing was showing as that he was determined to fulfill a particular assignment. Fast forward, when he was brought to Pontius Pilate, which is the um, pivot of our message today, when he got to Pontius Pilate, Pilate asked him a question. There has been a lot of accusations from these leading priests and the elders against you. What do you have to say? And I want to read that part again. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priest and the elders made the accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they are bringing against you? Pilate demanded. So actually, Pilate was expecting that as a normal human being, when charges are brought um, to um, the governor or when charges are made against you, you are expected to defend yourself. But strangely enough, Jesus did not answer. But Jesus made no response to any of these charges, much to the governor's surprise. That was the part that was fascinating the governor. He could not um, wrap his head around the fact that people have come to accuse you and you don't want to say anything against it because the accusations they brought forward can end you losing your life. So are you not afraid to die? But the man said nothing about it. So what I'm trying to bring um, to our attention today is that Jesus was so resolute on his assignment that he knew that his assignment here on earth was to be crucified. And he knew that being brought before Pontius Pilate was en route to that assignment. Because of that, he did not do anything contrary to fulfilling that assignment or that purpose for which he came on earth. And that was the statement that he finally heard. And I'm so sure that when Jesus heard that statement from the crowd, he could feel in his spirit that I was getting close to fulfilling my assignment. And that is what the people said in verse 23. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. And that was the exact thing Jesus needed to fulfill here on earth so that he will be able to redeem us from eternal condemnation. So irrespective of whatever he was going through, irrespective of what the circumstances were or the happenings around him were, which were not um, physically uh, enticing, but these are things that were going to take you through a lot of pain, anguish, and stress. He was looking at the final purpose for which he was here on earth, that he did not decide to get an easy exit. We are looking at the character of Jesus, the resolute Jesus. He will do anything, endure anything, just to make sure that he fulfills that purpose for which he is on earth. When a man is resolute, when a man is purposeful, he will not take any shortcut. That will take him off course. It doesn't matter the price he will pay. It doesn't matter the um, challenges that he will go through. He will make sure that he will sustain himself through it all. 
Jesus here had the opportunity to actually defend himself and he had the power. Another time he said, I can throw my life down and I can take it back. That means you can do nothing unless it has been given unto you. But what I'm enduring is why I'm here on earth. So don't feel as if you are the one in control. No, I know exactly what I am doing. And sometimes it happens to most of us in our daily activities. You might have a very terrible boss. You might have colleagues who don't really like you. You might, you might have classmates who hate you to the bone, but they don't understand that because of the purpose for which you are there, you keep your cool because you are looking at a bigger goal. Whatever they are doing does not affect you. If you happen to be in school and you have this lecturer who is very terrible, you know that you are there to achieve your certificate. So no matter what he will do, you will keep your calm. No matter how he will insult you, you will keep your calm. You will attend his lectures. And at the end of the day, you will get your certificate and then you move on from there. So people that are purposeful will not give excuses to escape what they actually want in life. And that is why we are using the pattern man, Jesus Christ. As we look at some of the characteristics of people that are resolute, I will bring into light other characters in the Bible that also portrayed similar traits. And at the end of it all, we'll sum it, and then God will grant us the grace to be able to exhibit or live this life of Christ. We want to quickly look at four characteristics of a person that is resolute or a believer that is resolute. What happens to a resolute um, personality or a resolute believer, and I'm talking about the context of Christians, is that these are people that see the horizontal, but their consideration, actually, what infers their decisions here on earth is what comes from the vertical. They don't just use their circumstances or they don't just use the happenings around or the going concern to determine what their life should be. They know exactly where to take inspiration from. And that is the vertical. They consult God concerning everything that happens. So instead of the physical inflicting pain here and there, they see all those things, yet they look at the heavens for their answer. We are talking about a group of people that operate with the sovereign will of God. So you see, the first and second point are interrelated. Because you consider the vertical, that means you are operating here on earth, but with the sovereign will of God. So if even if it is my will that, Lord, I don't want to go through this thing, when I consider the sovereign will of God, I will take some steps back. And then I will decide that, Lord, let your will be done. Let your perfect will be done. Grant me grace to endure. The third characteristic of a resolute believer is that their operation signifies somebody who is a slave or a servant. Why am I saying that? A slave or a servant is under the control of someone in authority. In the situation of Jesus, the commanding officer here was God the Father. And that was the story that we captioned here when we were discussing the fact that when Jesus was at Gethsemane, that time when he was praying, he was praying, Bible said, his tears became like drops of blood. The prayer was that, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass me by. At the end of it all, he said, let your will be done. So you see, he has a way he could have escaped it. But he said, no, I am a servant. And as long as I am a servant, once I've come into the fold of a human being, I am equal with you. But now I am a human being. I'm supposed to fulfill an assignment. So as I am a human being now, I'm supposed to take instructions from you. And that puts me in the realm of a servant. And the servant means that I must obey why you brought me here on earth. And is that I must die to fulfill that assignment. So even though the physical is pressing on me, even though I can see that it's difficult and I'm struggling here and there, at the end of it all, I must be able to live beyond my emotions. I must be able to live beyond what the physical is bringing towards me and fulfill that purpose and assignment for which I came. The final characteristic of a person that is resolute is that they don't give up. They press on to fulfill or accomplish their goal. As stressful as it might be, as painful as the situation might seem to present themselves, they keep pressing on. Pressing on means that it's not going to be on a silver platter. It's going to be very, very stressful. There were countless times that people wanted to hurt Jesus. There were countless times that people hated him to the bone, but he knew that he was on an assignment. He knew the perfect timing. He knew how everything had to play out, and he did exactly that. 
So I've enumerated four characteristics of a resolute person to you and we take all these cues from the life of Jesus Christ. One of the very crucial challenges that we face in our generation today is what I call broken focus. Every failure in life can be traced to the fact that there was focus broken at some point in time. So for you to become a purposeful person, you must be extremely focused, else failure is inevitable. The moment you begin to lose focus of your purpose or your agendas here on earth, failure is just waiting for you at the other side of the river. That is why Jesus did not break his focus. That was why Jesus, even at age 12, was found in the synagogue. That was why the life of Jesus was that he would go to the synagogue as was his custom to go and read the scrolls. It became part of him. It became his lifestyle. So brethren, what is the purpose for which we are here on earth? This will determine how we live our life. So when I see the lifestyle you are exhibiting, it tells me the kind of purpose that you have. Because you will be so engrossed in the purpose for which you are here on earth that everything else will mean nothing to you. Everybody else will see that there is a problem with you, but because of your focus on your purpose and your agenda, you are living a completely unique life that people don't understand. And trust me, people must not understand the kind of life you live. As long as you are focused, as long as you are pressing on to that goal that God brought you here on earth to fulfill, somebody's assignment is that they will climb high up the academic ladder and then because of the Spirit of God in them, they will bring sanity to the educational system. Somebody's aim is that they will become business moguls and the spirit of God that is within them will rectify everything that is happening which is not right in the business um, environment. Others will be um, custodians of the oracles of God. They will push the agendas of God and the kingdom of heaven. But understand that irrespective of where you find yourself, whether academia, whether politics, whether business, whether ministry, the assignment is one that the good news will be preached. I pray that as this message comes to us, we will now get a mind change. Our thought processes will shift so that we will be able to utilize our positions. We'll be able to use um, the, the platforms that we have to fulfill that unified agenda that Jesus came to show us the way, which is that the good news must be preached all over the place. So whether you are in academia, whether you find yourself in the business environment, whether you are in politics, whether you are in the front line of ministry, the assignment is one, that the good news will be preached and the poor will be saved. Because the poor actually is not those that don't have money in their pocket. The poor is the one that has not yet been saved. So when the Bible is talking about the go and preach the good news to the poor, what he's talking about is that the people that have not yet received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, um, they are the people that are being referred to as poor. So poverty in the um, scope of heaven is different from poverty as we look at it here on earth. You can be very loaded materially, but you are poor when heaven is looking at you down here on earth. So may God use us, may God help us to be able to avail ourselves that that ultimate aim that we are here on earth, to be workers in the vineyard, to bring the harvest together, we are not derailing from that assignment. I'll quickly talk about two other statements in the account of Luke that makes us understand that Jesus was bent on doing um, the work that he was sent here on earth to do, which is to be crucified and save humanity. If we look at Luke chapter 13 verse 22 and I read, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. Because he was bent on going to Jerusalem because that was what he was supposed to do. So irrespective of what he was doing, he was pushing on. When he was on his way to Jerusalem, they got to a town before Jerusalem. The people did not receive them because they realized that Jesus was not actually coming there. They decided to um, be hostile to them. And the disciples told Jesus, shall we call fire from heaven to burn this village? And Jesus rebuked them. Another part where Jesus also demonstrated purpose and unwavering character was in Luke chapter 13 again, but this time around the verse 31 and 32. This was the time that 
um, Jesus was grieved over Jerusalem because it seems as if Jerusalem, all they cared about was killing the prophets. And that was what the scripture actually said. So verse 31 and 32. At that time, some Pharisees said to him, get away from here if you want to leave. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox that I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And the third day, I will accomplish my purpose. This is someone that has just been told that somebody is looking for him to murder or to kill. And he goes on to say that, go and tell, see the name even Jesus gives to the, the ruler at the time, Herod. He said he's a fox. But you know what? Tell him that I'm not going to go today. I still have business here to do. I will still continue casting out demons. I will still continue preaching the word. I will still continue healing the sick. Then on the third day, I will leave. This is a man that is not afraid of anything. This is a man that knows exactly what he is about. This is a man that is determined. He is not moved. He is so purposeful. And his purpose makes people admire him. No wonder people all over the world have become disciples of him. He was such an amazing personality that we need to carefully pay attention to and follow the way he lived his life. He is the pattern man. And whatever he did, we are supposed to also follow the same. Now, as we are bringing our message today to a close, I want to introduce you to about four personalities in the Bible that also lived a very determined and purposeful life. The first one is Daniel. If you have time, you can consider the account of Daniel and read. Daniel was one of the Hebrew boys that were taken captive when Judah was under siege from Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. He was taken to the land of Babylon and right from the onset we realized that Daniel was so focused and so determined that he decided not even to eat the food that the king had prescribed for them knowing very well that that could cost him his life but God gave him so much wisdom and favor that as he stood for what he believed as he was purposeful as he was resolute in his character people did not hurt him God gave him grace to go through Fast forward, we get to a point when the people in Babylon were asked not to pray because they were finding ways and means to trap Daniel and his three other friends. So there was a decree that nobody should worship or pray to any other God. But then as it was the custom of Daniel, so Daniel also represents a character that was resolute. It was his custom to pray and he had specific times that he prayed. Irrespective of the decree that the king had just made in Babylon, Daniel went ahead to pray. And because Daniel had a lot of people that wanted him to fail in his assignment because he had been exalted, a lot of people were not happy about the fact that the king Nebuchadnezzar had favored Daniel and his three other friends. So they were always hatching a plan to make sure that Daniel and his three friends will be punished. So when the decree of the king came that nobody should pray to any other God, they were actually always around, lurking around to find out when he would make a mistake. And they knew that it was it was um, the custom of Daniel to pray at certain times. So they hid around his neighborhood. And then when it was time to pray, Bible said, Daniel opened his window and began to pray. And these people went to report Daniel to the king. The king now gets Daniel and then he brings Daniel to the palace. What is supposed to happen to Daniel here is that he's about to face the punishment of not obeying the king. And what was the decree? Don't pray. But he was resolute. He was so focused. He will not change his customs or anything because of what the king is saying. And this is what I'm saying. People that are resolute, are so focused, they are not looking for a way to escape. They will hold on to what they believe. The king asks him, he's able to explain everything. At the end of the day, the consequence is that Daniel will be thrown into the lion's den. Daniel could have explained himself. He could could have um, said things that the king, because the king liked him. The king had favored him. There was a lot of favor that Daniel was receiving from the king. He was one of the 
people that the king did not play with at all when he came to governing um, Babylon at the time. Because Daniel had exhibited skill and wisdom that was not found anywhere in Babylon. When it was time for Daniel to explain the dreams and all of those things, the Bible said that none of the wise men, the divinators and magicians were able to do that. Daniel did it to the point that the king said that the Holy Spirit lives in him. So this is an asset for the king. But the king had been put in a situation where he's helpless. He has to obey his own rule. As painful as it was for him, because he has said it, he has to follow through. And the people trapped the king so that he would punish Daniel. But you would expect that Daniel would actually beg and give excuses. He said no. So he had to be thrown into the lion's den. That is the mark of a resolute man. And God indeed honored himself in his case. The king woke up in the morning. He couldn't sleep all night. He shouted, Daniel, has the God in whom you believe in rescued you? Amazing. This is the kind of people that we are talking about. They are so bent on doing what is right that nothing will deter them from it. There were other three Hebrew boys that got captured together with Daniel, and they also had to face a similar challenge. There was a golden image that Nebuchadnezzar made and the decree was that when the blast of the music goes off, everybody should bow and worship that idol. But these three Hebrew boys said they will not do it. People go ahead to report these three Hebrew boys to the king and the king goes ahead to invite them to the palace and asks them and even gives them an opportunity again that if the music goes off, bow down and worship. This is because the king did not want to hurt them. The king realized that they were valuable people to him. But these are laws and regulations. And because he has passed that law, the law also supersedes he himself, the king. So I'm giving you a chance to escape. And like I said, one of the characteristics of a resolute person is that they will not look for shortcuts to escape. They will not look at the physical things that are happening, but they will consider the sovereignty of God. So here is the case. Am I supposed to give up on the God that I, I believe and I trust in? Because I know that God said, thou shalt not worship any other God apart from me. But here is it that I'm faced with imminent danger. I could lose my life. Should I just give up on God and save myself? No, a resolute man will not do that. They will go through the punishment and the name of God will be glorified, even at their peril. So the three Hebrew boys tell Nebuchadnezzar that, Sir, we will not bow to these um, idols. We believe, we trust in our God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We know he will deliver us. But just in case today he decides not to deliver us, we still will not bow to these idols. They get thrown into the fire. The fire was actually heated seven more times, and they were thrown into the fire. But guess what? A fourth person shows up in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar says, that person I see, the countenance is like the Son of God. Hallelujah to Jesus. These are resolute people. Another personality we can consider quickly is that of Joseph. Joseph had a vision. He knew exactly what God wanted to do with his life. He got sold by his brothers. He suffered a lot in the palace. He suffered so much under um, Potiphar. And he got to a point, he had an escape route. This is the situation where Potiphar's wife likes you. Potiphar's wife is actually enticing you to sleep with her. And if you are sleeping with Potiphar's wife, that means everything will be available for you. Life will be easy because the wife actually promises this young man that if you sleep with me, everything that I have, I would open it up unto you. Because the people that rule is not actually the king, it is the wife. If you doubt this one, look at what happened to Jezebel and Ahab. Ahab was the king, but the authority was actually in the hand of Jezebel. So that was a situation. Joseph could have used that as an escape route and said, you know what, I'm suffering too much. But you see, he made this statement which indicates a resolute person. He said, I will not sin against my God and the king. These are the statements of resolute people. Finally, we want quickly to look at that of Paul, the Apostle Paul, first class Apostle Paul. There was this one time that 
there was a belt there and a mighty prophet called Agabus was around. He took the belt, put it around his waist and immediately he began to prophesy. He said, the one that owns this belt, what is happening to me now is what was about to happen to him. The belt that I fastened to myself, that is the same way he's about to be fasting where he goes to the place he has decided to go to. And guess what? Paul comes out and says that, I know what you are talking about, but it's not just about binding me with a belt. My soul is already bound. That means I am resolute. I have been sold out for this cause. No matter what it is, this assignment that God has given me must be fulfilled. There was a time he was giving intel that there were men that had lay siege against waiting for him and they decided that they would not eat anything or drink anything until they kill him. And Paul will still go ahead to preach the good news. These are men that were resolute. It is my prayer today that God will give me grace. God will grant you grace that as we journey in the things of the kingdom, we will be able to be resolute to our cause. May we not sell our faith for a morsel of bread. And these were people that we've seen from the illustration that lived their lives to please God, irrespective of what they were going through, even at the peril of their lives. May God help all of us to be able to live this exemplary life because believe it or not, your life is beyond you. A lot more people are looking up to us and may we not disappoint them. Shall we say a word of prayer? Father, we bless you. We thank you. Let your spirit brood over your word. Let it be a blessing to all and sundry that are gathered to here today. We pray that you help us to be resolute people and the character of Jesus, which was the resolute Jesus, will be our portion today, tomorrow, and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Beloved, share the message with someone. Subscribe, click the notification button, and together, we are fulfilling our assignment here on earth. Be resolute. Let nothing of the circumstances around you deter you from sharing the gospel to somebody, preaching the word of God to somebody, ministering to somebody, being there physically or online to somebody. And these are some of the things that we do to keep us resolute. No matter what you are going through, no matter the pain, the challenges, the scarcity, make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be preached. And at the end of it all, your name will be that faithful servant. Welcome home. Till we meet again next week, this has been the Theophilus Lamte Ministry. And as always, my name is Theophilus Lamte. See you again next week. It's bye-bye for now.